evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm still the director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Tonight's conversation on medical marijuana will be moderated by Dr. Stacy Gruber, director of the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Corps at McLean Hospital. She is associate professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School and the director of the recently launched MIND program, that's M-I-N-D, Marijuana Investigation for Neuroscientific <coughs> Discovery. MIND is designed to clarify the effects of recreational and most recently medical marijuana on brain structure. Now millions of Americans and people around the globe rely on Dr. Sanjay Gupta to help them understand complex health issues and advise them on the practice of good health care. Dr. Gupta works at, as a neurosurgeon at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. He is also assistant professor of neurosurgery at Emory University School of Medicine. On top of that, he's the chief medical correspondent for CNN and a special correspondent for CBS News and a regular columnist for Time Magazine. So he must stay in good health. <laughs> On television and the internet and in his writings, he is a calming voice who gives us the information and reassurance we need during medical crisis and at times of growing healthcare fears. His global presence as the world's primary care physician is a service to millions and a benefit to all. We welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going fast, fast, going fast. Well, I was about to say our esteemed guest needs no introduction, but we've just had an introduction, <laughs> you see. So my introduction probably would fall flat. I think Thanks. most of you know exactly who Dr. Gupta is and what he's done, which is rather extraordinary. What many of you may or may not know is that Dr. Gupta launched a groundbreaking documentary called Weed and subsequently Weed 2 entitled Cannabis Madness. And I thought in order to sort of foster and set the groundwork for our discussion tonight, we would actually watch a clip from Weed 2, just in case some of you haven't seen it. Can we have the first clip, please? Oh, okay. I do have it. Yeah. In his compelling documentary, Weed. You've okay. looked at the evidence. There is real science now out there. He was flat out wrong about weed. A year-long journey that changed what many of us thought about marijuana, okay. myself included. Uh, I think, you know, we've been terribly and systematically misled. We used to only picture this. Right. Then we showed you this. Medical marijuana treating seizures, pain, dozens of other ailments. Charlotte's doing amazing, just better and better each month. But we learned this wasn't the end of the story. It was just the beginning. I think we went from about 150 calls a month to over 4,000. There are still so many issues to be addressed. The federal government says marijuana is among the most addictive drugs with no medicinal value. Many serious scientists say they're wrong. It's a medicine. It's the politics of pot, pitting policy against patients. Trapped in the middle, Sick, qualified people who want medical marijuana but can't get it because it's illegal. If you try to go back to Ohio with Jordan's medication, we'll be arrested. All for a plant that you're going to see can work wonders for pain in a grown man, MS in a woman at the peak of her life, and seizures in a little girl. We traveled the globe asking scientists, patients, and policymakers for a solution. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. And this is Weed 2, Cannabis Madness. So I hope that's certainly intriguing for all of you. It makes you want to absolutely go and watch. Oh, no? Never? Oh. So what I was going to say in my introduction that wasn't an introduction was that Weed and Weed 2 have been viewed countless thousands of times online. It's hundreds of thousands of times, actually. And it sparked controversy and discussion among politicians and policymakers, doctors and patients teachers and students, parents and children, really across the world. So tell us a little bit about what happened with your research. Well, you and I met first a year and a half ago, something like that, when you were researching it. Yeah. Um, let, let me just say thank, thank you uh, for, for allowing me to be here. And uh, you know, I, I love discussions like this. I think that we don't uh, do enough of this sort of discussion in our society. We, uh, the, adult, the idea of adults. Uh, lifelong learning. I, I, I love attending these sorts of things uh, as, a, as, a, as a 
observer. So to be here in front of you, it's a, it's a real privilege, a real honor. So th thank you for that. Um, this is a provocative topic, as, as Stacy mentioned. And my, my viewpoints on this uh, have, have evolved over time. When, when we started to focus on this, and when I first met you a year and a half ago, uh, we were in the process of making a documentary about medical marijuana uh, with no, no clear idea as to exactly what the documentary was going to look like in the end. Um, I had, uh, like a lot of other topics as a journalist, it was something that I had been, I'd covered in various ways for television and also as a columnist for Time Magazine. And um, you know, in the past, had had written various articles about specific aspects of medical marijuana, most of which were were um, not not particularly enthusiastic about its potential. So when we started doing this as well, I wanted to actually delve into it and show where I thought the science stood. And frankly, I didn't think the science was going to show much. And and uh, that was sort of the, the beginning of that journey. And it was one of the best sort of things as a journalist to be able to walk into a topic eyes wide open. And if you're a curious person about this, to be able to travel around the world, talk to the experts who are really on the front lines of this, and at the end of it, create something that I think would, would uh, hopefully educate people about this issue in an engaging way. That, that's, that's all that we were thinking at that point. And, and you were one of our, our first, or very early interviews in this whole thing. talking about marijuana and the fact that you didn't necessarily think it was a particularly positive thing in terms of recreational use, perhaps. And then I'm not sure how that dovetailed with medical marijuana. But I think a number of people wonder, what made you change your mind? Because you had what could be considered a little bit of an about face about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was, it was an about face. And um, the, the background on this was I, I looked at the, the literature in the United States on this topic. And, a lot of times in the scientific community, we have various resources to, to look at uh, broad swaths of the literature. Um, and you, you start to look at all these papers and these abstracts. And, and in my case, I will spend you know, days sort of going through all these articles and, and d dive deeper into some that I think are particularly interesting, either because of the number of patients involved or the, 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 the way that the study was conducted. But when I started to look at all of that research in the United States, it wasn't particularly compelling. I mean, it, it looked like most of the, the, the data was really showing what the harmful effects of marijuana was on the body mm -hmm. and on the brain. And that was sort of why I was, uh, it, it informed a lot of my writing on this topic over several years. And the article that I wrote in 2006 was uh, for Time Magazine, which was a, one of their big stories that year, was about, it was on the, it was on the ballot in several states. Right. I wanted to, to inform people what the medical literature was showing, and, and, and I wasn't particularly compelled by it. Right. What happened in between was that um, I started to look at literature from other countries, and I started to look at labs that were not funded by the federal government, private labs. And it was interesting because it was easy to dismiss those, those studies, uh, too easily dismissed, but I think that once I started to look at them and and then go visit these places and go visit these countries, a different picture started to emerge. And this is before we shot any film. We hadn't shot anything yet. This is just the background. Oh. Um, and I started to realize that there was probably something a little bit more here. Uh, I went and met with the guy who is the father of marijuana research in Israel, a guy named uh, Roth Meshulam, um, a very prestigious scientist, won the Israeli Prize for Science. At one point, he was the first person to isolate THC. Exactly. He was subsequently able to synthesize THC, and uh, he, he, was, he, he was starting to do some amazing work still in the, in the whole idea of therapeutics. So as I started to put this together, and then I went and met with patients, I realized that I had, uh, in my own way, probably dismissed many patients as malingerers who were just trying to get stoned. And there are a lot of those people, but there are also a lot of very, very um, legitimate patients as well for whom not only did I realize that medical marijuana was working for them, mm -hmm. it was working for them when nothing else had. Right. And, and it took on a different sense of urgency for me because this, this now became not just a medical story, uh, this became a medical social and political story sure. in many ways. And so much about it was hard to understand. How did we get to this point where 
it was it was treated as a as one of the most dangerous substances in the United States. So just real quick, I'll, I'll just tell you, going back to the literature in the United States, one thing I realized was that most of the studies that were getting funded in this country were studies that were designed to find harm. So a researcher goes, they, they apply for a grant, they want federal money, and they also want the substrate, the marijuana, to be able to study that also came from the federal government. And 90, I think we, we calculated over about a, um, 12 year period, 4,000 some studies, 93, I think 93, 94% of them were studies where the hypothesis was, what harm. is the harm? What's the harm? And a single digit percentage were on benefit. And when you looked at it, it was a very distorted picture. It was the picture that I was distorted by and uh, why I wrote all those articles. And then when I started to, to dive deeper, that's when the about face started to occur. Right. So as a journalist who happens to be a physician, researching this in such a way that where you're traveling literally to other countries. I mean, you did an extraordinary amount of research on this topic really before you ever shot any film, apparently, right. which I didn't know. Yeah. Do you see any difference in your opinion as a journalist trying to bring a story sort of to the nation, right? Everybody thinks of Dr. Gupta as America's doctor versus your position as a physician, somebody who really <laughs> invested in preventing or treating human suffering. It's, it's a great question. and. Um, you know, it's one of these questions I think sometimes that, uh, you know, you're a doc, I'm a doc, and we, we have these conversations, and I think there's an objectiveness to this, and there's a subjective sure. quality to this as well. Objectively, I felt very comfortable because I think ultimately we, we live in the world of, of facts and science and data, and I, it, when I started to, to um, write about this and, you know, wrote the op-ed and, and things like that and started to put together this documentary, I felt very... Uh, I felt like we, we, we were standing on very firm ground with regard to what we were saying. But I'm also a doctor and I'm also a dad. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> nowadays, you know, you got um, things live forever. And, yes, and I've I, seen that quote, something along the lines of, I would never allow my children, or, or I would never suggest that my children smoke marijuana. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, people make, make the, the, the leaps all of a sudden. If you're talking about this in any way, that means you condone it completely. You're right. encouraging young kids to smoke marijuana, all of that sort of stuff. And of course, none of that is true, but that hardly matters sometimes. And what is put out there and, and lives forever is right. memorialized. That's the subjective nature of this, because you know, I, didn't, I didn't want that, that either. And also this idea that, that perception is, is the reality. I had one of my um, colleagues, someone I respect very much, come talk to me about this. And, and uh, you know, um, so we had this long conversation. I'll never forget where essentially he said, look, you know, we, we see the science. We, 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 we're looking at the same papers you're at. And we agree with you. We, we, I mean, that, that, that's, it, it seems like it's not only beneficial, but it's, it's filling a void in some particularly difficult areas of medicine to treat, refractory pain and, and refractory epilepsy and things like that, things that we've had challenges treating in the neuroscience space for a long time. But do you really want to be that guy was sort of the question he was asking. Do you want to be the guy who's out there pushing marijuana, which I wasn't doing, I wasn't pushing it, but, but it, 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 was, it was that whole thing. So that, that, that's, a, uh, that's a challenge, I think, um, you know, it was a, of a particular challenge with this with this topic. I think for everybody, somehow you're perceived as pushing pushing pot if you're researching pot, right? That's right. It, and of course, the science of marijuana and cannabis is more than just smoking marijuana. A absolutely, and and you know, when you really start, to, I was intrigued by the fact that people really wanted the science of this. Yeah. What does it do to my brain? Right. This stuff, you know, and and how does that change as I get older? And, I mean, they were asking me questions like, what is a CB1 receptor? Where are they located? And I thought, wow, we're, we're, if nothing else, we've, we've elevated the discussion about this in, in this country. Which is great. So because you raised CB1 receptors, he <laughs> said it, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a really important thing to remember that people often think of marijuana as one thing. Um, you know, pot, marijuana, it's, it's one thing. When in fact, we know it isn't. What's your feeling about explaining to the public the differences between the constituents in marijuana and how they may exert different effects? I, I think you. I think a, a, a thorough discussion about you know cannabis. You, you have to talk about the the different components mm -hmm. of, of of the plant. And I think there's sort of two parts of that discussion. One is that the different parts of the plant seem to do different things. Right. And so the immediate assumption when you talk about this is that somebody is, is getting high and they're smoking it. 
And neither one of those things necessarily have to be the case. There, there, there are strains of marijuana that seem to have significant medicinal benefit, which don't actually have very little of the psychoactive ingredient. The THC is what makes people high. If and you just back up, just in case the audience isn't 100% yeah. sure. So THC is considered the main psychoactive component in marijuana, while CBD or cannabidiol is not particularly uh, psychoactive or doesn't make you high. Right, and, and, they, and so CBD and, and THC, and CBD seems to have other therapeutic benefits in the body. We, we, it was it's interesting because for a long time I thought that they, the people thought that they were just sort of antagonistic to one another. Yeah. You know, CBD would modulate the, the how, how high somebody became, or how, the, the feelings of psychoactive euphoria, all of that. But now we realize that there's these receptors in the body that, to which CBD can bind that could cause these benefits. Uh, for seizures, for example, um, it could actually uh, create, a, create a, a, a pattern in the brain that would reduce the amount of seizures, decrease the amount of electrical activity in certain parts of the brain. Stacy and I were together earlier today talking about the fact that CBD could uh, act as a anti-inflammatory uh, in the brain after someone has had a head injury or a stroke. And what was striking to me was in the context of the fact that this is an illegal substance in the country and, and defined as being of no medicinal benefit. As part of our documentary, we learned that the Department of Health and Human Services has a patent on components of marijuana for this very purpose, for the idea of actually protecting the brain after head injury or stroke. So on one hand, you have a situation where it's illegal, no benefit at all, but we're just gonna keep a patent just, just in case. There's been a lot of momentum around that, but there are these different chemicals. The, the second part of the discussion was the fact that, you know, it's probably made up of some 400 chemicals. Right. And we don't know what they all do, but they probably all do something. And so the idea of taking out a single ingredient and creating a medicine out of that is, is understandably desirable, but may not offer the same benefits as the plant itself, a whole plant extract being turned into a medicine which I thought was intriguing. This, it's, it goes against the way that we develop drugs in this country. Exactly. It's, it's completely different. And maybe why there hasn't been much interest in, in marijuana, this idea that do you, do you patent a plant? I mean, who's, whose is it at that point? If you're just taking these whole plant extracts and creating medications out of it, do you patent the process by which you extract the ingredients? There were all these various questions that came up. One thing we realized is that there wasn't a lot of there weren't a lot of advocates for it within the pharmaceutical industry or certainly within the government. Right. And, and, and th those are some very legitimate barriers. Right. So some of the studies that we've seen, clinical trials of synthetic marijuana, Mabalone or Marinol, we have patients that say they don't necessarily feel particularly better after taking it or they try it. It doesn't do the same thing as when they use it recreationally with a friend. Perhaps it's because it's not distilled from the entire plant. Is it possible that that's why some of the synthetics have not necessarily been as popular, if you will? I, I think that, that that's that's exactly it. And I think that you know when when you talk to people like Roth Meshulam, who who you know has been studying this for a long time, I think he's in his eighties now. He's the granddaddy of marijuana He's the granddaddy of, really. uh, and he's this really <laughs> mild mannered guy, and he's he's so thoughtful when he talks about these things. But the idea that these other compounds in the plant may help transport. Mm -hmm. the more active ingredients to the places in the body that they need to be. The idea that these other compounds can open up a receptor and therefore make the active ingredients work better right. or more enhanced. Not entirely sure about all that. I will tell you a side story, although you may, you may know this story, but you know, he, he, he postulated that you know, we evolved as human beings with this plant, with the marijuana plant. It's been around since 4000 BC, right? The Chinese used it as medicine. They use it. They use it as a medicine back then, and right. it was in the pharmacopoeia in this country so up until the 42, 40s. right? Yeah, and now it's a class one scheduled substance. Right. right. We used to have it as a as a part of the the, the, the book that doctors would write prescriptions from, and and right. and evolve from that into this this schedule one substance. But he said because we evolved with this, it is quite likely that we actually have these cannabinoids in our system already, that we make them in our system. So he was on a quest for some time, as you may know, mm -hmm. to find what is the human sort of cannabinoid? What do we, do we actually make this? And what he, he found a substance that actually was a cannabinoid that is made by the human body. Anandamide. And it was interesting because he, he, um, he was in Israel at the time and he, he found the substance and he didn't know what to call it. 
initially. He wanted to call it substance of supreme bliss. That's what he wanted to call it. And he realized no in, bias there. there was no word in Hebrew <laughs> that meant supreme bliss. He could not, I, I don't know what it was. There was just no word that actually fit. So he went to the Sanskrit language and found the word ananda, which means supreme bliss. And anandamide is our bodies and cannabinoids, right. which I thought was interesting. It's very interesting. So after all this research, from your perspective, what do you see as the greatest possibilities currently for medical marijuana in terms of conditions or populations? And what are some of the frustrations or limitations around the research? You know, I think because I, I uh, have lived so long in the world of neuroscience, I've been really interested in, in the, the idea that um, some of the, the, the medical aspects of marijuana could, could help treat some of these neurodegenerative and, mm -hmm. and, and neuro-related things, everything from pain and the, and the type of pain that I'm talking about is a, is a neuropathic pain. It's the sort of lancinating pain that's, that's pins and needles that oftentimes is caused by an injury to a nerve or a nerve root. Um, I was really fascinated by this little girl that we, you, should, you saw a clip of there, Charlotte Figgy, and her intractable seizures. This is a girl who was having seizures 300 times a week. Her seizures were so, so frequent that her mom would just have her in this baby Bjorn and she'd carry her around and just feel her seizing all the time and there was nothing she could do about it. She was tried on seven different anti-epileptic drugs, all of which were pretty toxic drugs, very sedating, essentially zombified her. They were at the point where they were about to compound a veterinary medication and try and use it in a human for the first time because nothing was really working for her. And her father, who was over in Afghanistan, in the military and worried out of his mind for his daughter, just started going on YouTube and, and saw a clip of somebody using a high CBD, non-psychoactive oil right. for a kid that had these types of seizures. And he called his wife in, back in Colorado and said, you know, should we try this? We actually have that clip. All right. And actually, this may be a very good time to show that clip with this perfect introduction. Can we have clip number two, please? It was January 2012, Afghanistan. About 7,000 miles away from his family in Colorado, Matt Figgy received this video from his wife, Paige. It's horrible seeing these videos when I'm deployed. It was his five-year-old daughter, Charlotte, seizing. Diagnosed with a severe form of epilepsy, she was having 300 seizures a week, each attack so severe it had the potential to kill her. They had already tried dozens of high-powered drugs. We needed to try something else, and at that point in time, marijuana was that natural course of action to try. At home in Colorado, Paige searched for marijuana high in CBD. That's the ingredient some scientists think helps seizures, and also low in THC. Remember, she didn't want to get her daughter stoned. She found a small amount at a Denver dispensary. The owner was surprised that anyone would even want it. And they said, it's funny because no one buys this, you know. Um, that was the general consensus, that nobody wanted it. It didn't have any effect. Paige paid $800 for a small bag and took it home. I had a friend that was starting a business on making medicine. And I said, can you help me extract the medicine from the, this bag of marijuana? <laughs> I measured it with a syringe and squirted it under her tongue. It was exciting and very nerve-wracking. Holding Charlotte in her arms, Paige waited. An hour ticked by, and then another, and then another. She didn't have a seizure that day, and then she didn't have a seizure that night. Did you sit there and sit yeah. there look at your watch? And... <laughs> right, I thought, this is crazy. And yeah. then she didn't have one the next day, and then the next day, and I thought, that is, yeah. she would have had 100 by now. And I just, I know, I just thought, this is insane. I remember how happy Paige was, like, it's really working, I can't believe it. Yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing to hear. So, incredibly compelling video. And in fact, in week one, the footage is unbelievably moving. And for people who haven't seen anything like this, I think it's incredibly important to show them what can happen, secondary treatment. But there are others who say that there's a fair amount of concern in giving marijuana, which again is still a class one substance, to pediatric populations and to children. We're just now seeing the first clinical trial 
in New York and, and San Diego. What do you say to folks who are concerned about it? Well, <clears throat> I, I would say two things. First of all, you know, Paige and, and, and Matt and, and Charlotte, they, they're one family yeah. emblematic of, of hundreds of families. You know, we tell a story sometimes when we do these documentaries, um, recognizing that the story is important to tell, but it's, it's, not, it's, not, just, it's not just one story. And, right. and, and we, you know, it, it's not just one anecdotal thing. And, and we get into that in the documentary as well. So, you know, I, people walk away thinking, well, this is a, it's an isolated case. How could, how could you, how could you make it that big a deal about this? It's because we kept hearing uh, hundreds of stories like this. With regard to the, you know, the risk and benefit ratio, which is I think what everybody fundamentally wants to know, sure. and maybe even more so with, with kids, um, I think it's a very legitimate question. And, and you know, I have a nine, seven, and five-year-old myself, so you, know, you couldn't help but think about your own kids a bit when you're making a documentary like this and you see a kid who's having 300 seizures a week. It's just, it's, it's really heartbreaking stuff. Of course. But I also knew that she had been on these seven different medications ahead of time. None of which had worked. None of which had worked and all had significant toxicity. Right. And each time a new medication was given, there was a risk-benefit analysis. Sure. And to give you an idea of just how toxic some of these medications were, they could cause cardiac problems. Twice, little Charlotte went to cardiac arrest, not from the seizures, but from the medications. Mm -hmm. One time, they, they were absolutely convinced she was going to die. Uh, they called the ambulance, she, you know, they, they uh, I mean, Paige told me that she basically said goodbye to her daughter. And it was, you know, it's tough to talk about and hear about, but that was their reality. Sure. And it was just 300 seizures a week. If you think about that, that's 45 seizures, 50 seizures a day. It's, yeah. it's just all the time. So the toxicity, the risk benefit, you know, sort of analysis was something they had sort of already gone through. With regard to a high CBD marijuana, there was, it didn't seem to be much evidence that it was gonna possibly cause an overdose, possibly yeah. cause a, an arrest of her heart or her, her lungs, her ability to breathe, and it could possibly work. So when people ask me about this thing, I say, y you know, it, there's always, potential risks with these medications. I think you have to take in the context of what the risks are of what the person has already tried sure. and also what the potential benefits are. Um, she, was, she was not going to survive this. She was going to die of, of, her, of her disease. And I can tell you that was near the end of the documentary. You saw some improvements already. She is basically mainstreamed now yeah. in school. And uh, you know you would not recognize her. This is a child who couldn't walk previously. A child who couldn't walk, a child yeah. who could not function, a child who was not in school, a child who was always on medications, mm -hmm. essentially zombified. She has siblings who did not recognize their sibling. She's a twin, isn't she? She has a twin, yeah. and so it was. It was just. Um, it was incredible. And I went and saw her this these past holidays, just because you know you get close to your people that you, you do documentaries about, and it's the holidays, and <laughs> it's kind of funny. She walked right up to me. I didn't know that she'd even remember me and shook my hand, Amazing. this little girl, and took me around to meet all these people in the house, was introducing me to them. It was kind of an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she takes this ointment, you saw this oil, mm -hmm. still twice a day. It's uh, squirted into her mouth. Uh, sort of just sublingual under the tongue. Just under the tongue. It absorbs across the, the mucous membranes mm -hmm. in the mouth, and that's it. Amazing. No other medication. Amazing. It's, it's, pre it's pretty remarkable. So she's not an isolated case. And one of the things that comes out in Weed 2 is the fact that there are families, countless families, who are faced with incredibly difficult decisions of what to do because state regulations, of course, are not currently in accordance with federal regulations. What do you see as the greatest hurdle for these <laughs> families who are desperate to get treatment for their children? Well, the, the, the scenario is, is pretty remarkable to me. And I, I wouldn't have believed this if I, if I didn't see it with my own eyes. But you, you, you have a situation now because of this, this federal state dichotomy where in the state of Colorado, for example, where we did a lot of our filming, they could gain access to what is now called Charlotte's Web. Right. Named for her. Named for this little girl. And it's a strain that they believe can help this, this intractable epilepsy. But if you go there, take your child there to try this out, and it works, you are stuck because you can't take it with you out of the state. If you take it with you out of the state, you could be arrested for drug trafficking, and that is real. That has happened. And so families who take this oil, that is a high CBD, non-psychoactive oil, and they're transporting it, trying to transport it home, 
could, could lose their child, first of all, the child they're trying to help, and they could be put in prison for drug trafficking. So then that's a real problem. So what you, what the situation that has emerged is you have hundreds of families, maybe more now, that have essentially packed up their whole lives and just moved to Colorado. Hmm. They quit their jobs, they sold their homes, they just moved in order to be able to give their child this, this thing that, that works for them. It doesn't work for everybody. Right. But there have been a lot of people for whom it has, and they're, they're stuck in this, this, this limbo where they, they, they just have to, they're, they're, they're medical marijuana refugees mm -hmm. living in Colorado. And it's, it's you know, I, I've met many of them. It's, a, it's an extraordinary situation. What do you say to people who say, can we really call marijuana a medicine? There's no accepted guidelines with regard to potency, dose, mode of use, frequency of use. That doesn't necessarily jive with what we know in America as, quote, medicine. But we have, quote, medicinal marijuana laws in the states, you know, in the legislation in each state. What do you say about that? Is it medicine? Well, you know, and I, and I, and I would love to get your take on this as well as one of the leading researchers in this area. But, but I, I will tell you, it's, it's a strange situation. I mean, look, I, I grew up in the world of, you know, I went to medical school and I, I saw how, you know, we prescribe medications and I saw the... the you know, in the United States, we have a certain amount of expectation when a doctor hands you a prescription for a medication right. that this medication is going to be safe, it's going to be effective, it's going to be the best thing for me. I mean, that, that's an expectation that we just sort of take for granted, I think, in some ways. Marijuana has not gone through that process in this country. We right. haven't gone through the FDA and done the clinical trials that are, that are large, randomized trials, right. all those things that you, you'd want. And yet the states have spoken in 23 states. Where are they? 23, right? 23 plus DC. 23 yes, plus exactly. DC. 24. And said, we're, we, we, we understand that's how it's normally done, but we need to fast track it or we need to do it a different way in this state because we think it needs to be available now. So, so policy um, is sort of outpaced science the, in this regard. The policy has outpaced the science. Mm -hmm. And I think that that creates some, some, some barriers. What exactly are you getting? What strain should you be using? Right. What dose should you be taking? All that sort of stuff. We don't always have answers to those questions, and those are those are questions that patients, you know, have a legitimate desire to know, and, and, and they, they ask these questions. So, it's 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 a bizarre situation. I don't think there's anything else quite like it with regard to a to a medication in this country. And and there hasn't been anything like it in past history that I can recall. No, I I, I, I can't think of anything like it. And I've I've done lots of interviews where I've talked to the commissioner of the FDA. I've talked to the, the head of NIDA, which is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and asked that same question. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's the states that have made these decisions. And I said, well, why wasn't it you? Why, why wasn't it the FDA? And, and I think at some point, um, what I'm feeling is that the science is gonna start to catch up. Fill the gaps. It's gonna start to fill some of those gaps. Where do you see the line between recreational and medical marijuana? Do you feel that they're different? Are they perceived by the country in a different way? I think with regard to recreational marijuana, it's almost been a, a question of how much perceived harm and how much perceived risk there has been. Um, that's been what's really driven that discussion. So, and the per per perceived risk, as you well know, has, has gone down. Continues to drop every Continu year. And, and use rates go up. It goes and like this. It's right. very concerning. As, per as perception of risk goes down, usage rates go up. Right. It, it, and, and, um, you know, I think we have to, you know, in the media, from the media standpoint, as well as the medical standpoint, we've got to educate on both ends. Right. Got to educate on the potential benefits, but also the potential risks. You know, you brought up at the very beginning my own kids. I, you know, this is not something I'm encouraging children to do. Stacy Gruber, Dr. Gruber, has done some of the, the foremost research on the impact on the brains uh, of young people, the, the developing brains of young people. And it's pretty, pretty compelling to look at that work. And, and when I look at that research um, in a non, in say, from a recreational standpoint, a non-medicinal standpoint, right. I think there's real concerns about people who, whose, in particular whose brains are still developing using this product recreationally. I mean, I, I think you'd agree with that, right? I, I absolutely do, and I think we need a lot more research to understand the real differences between the two. People tend to think that recreational and medical marijuana are somehow the same. And in fact, we, we need to really clearly delineate the differences because they do exist. People who are taking recreational marijuana are typically taking strains that are much higher in THC, um, and they may be taking all sorts of different things, whereas with medical marijuana, they, they may be taking smaller doses, more consistent strains, things that are uh, designed to achieve a particular benefit. And not necessarily just to get you high, like most people 
right. may assume with medical marijuana. I, I thought it was fascinating what you shared with me today that, that people, especially again at, at a young age, who are using marijuana regularly, recreationally, we can now objectively see some of the changes in their brains. Yes, we can. The, the, there's there's white, the white matter area and the, and, the, and the effects of that, right? We do see changes in white matter in terms of earlier versus later onset of smoking, which is a concern for recreational users, and I always get the question, which is why I pose it to you. Well, what, what do we think is gonna happen with medical marijuana? Will the same thing be the result? And we just don't know yet. We, it, it comes back down to risk reward right. again, but I, but I, I thought it was so interesting to, to be able to now look at people's brains and say you know the, the old commercials. Uh, many of you are probably too young to remember, but it was like this is your brain and it was a fried egg or it was an egg, and then it was, this is your brain on drugs and it was that egg in a frying pan. Remember that? It was like what is really happening to your to your brain? And and now because of some of your work, we know that the white matter in the brain, which is sort of like, think of the white matter as sort of the highways in the brain, the, the areas that connect the cities of the brain. The important areas that are the gray matter and the gray nuclei of the brain, but they gotta transmit signals to different parts of the brain through the white matter. And people who use marijuana early onset, as you call it, at a young age, before the brain was fully developed, tend to have disruptions in the white matter. It just doesn't work as well, the roads get, kind of damaged, I guess. There's exactly. a lot of potholes. Lots of drugs. potholes, exactly. I think of it as construction that shouldn't be there. Right. right. There's all sorts of things set up and it's not gonna be a smooth ride. That's right. And, and it seems that if you started using marijuana at a young age recreationally, that those potholes are particularly hard to fix, meaning they, they last longer than, 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 than you, would, you would hope. It's not just a short-term thing. You could have longer-term problems with those roads. If you, use, if you started using marijuana young. We, yeah, and that's something that we need to look at additionally, sort of what happens when people stop using? Does it come back? Right. What, what do they look like longitudinally? So I could sit here and talk with you all day about this and go through a myriad of questions, but I think at this point I need to open it up to our audience who's been so patient and quiet. Um, and I believe there are some ground rules. Let me see if I can do it without my cheat sheet. There are microphones located on the floor, now be the flight attendant, on the floor and behind you in the loge. What I'd ask is for each of you to identify yourselves. <laughs> no, don't identify someone else. Identify yourselves, pose a question, and remember that a question ends in a question mark, okay? <laughs> yeah. I think I've, yeah. And, and we, we, I just report the news. I don't want to make the news. I hear that this forum has a habit of uh, <laughs> making some news, so. <laughs> well, it is Harvard. It is Harvard. So if, uh, does anybody, anybody have a question for Dr. Gupta? Or, yeah. or Dr. Gupta. <laughs> or, or me, yes. Hi, uh, Jim Kernick, I have a, a question for you in relation to the unique position of marijuana and the government. Do you know of any other natural product that was far part of the pharmacopoeia that was removed without any scientific evidence for its removal? Great question. I, I, um, I don't off the top of my head, but you know, uh, it's interesting. I know there have been other substances over time that have been used for medical applications that have subsequently not been, and, and we have Rick Doblin here in the audience as well, sitting in the back, who, who uh, has done a lot of work in this area, and uh, we spent some time together today. E ecstasy, in fact, at this university at one time was used to treat PTSD, is that right, Rick? Is that? Oh, hey, how you doing? And, and, and what's the status on, on that now? I'm, I'm going to be reprimanded if you don't step to the microphone. <laughs> I can feel it coming from the sidelines. Well, spare me the, the castigan. Yeah, uh, well, I'm Rick Dobbin. I got my, district, my PhD from the Kennedy School here on the regulation of the medical use of Schedule I drugs. So the, the MDMA study for PTSD is, um, is what we're mostly doing. The cancer patient study here, um, it was difficult to recruit patients because we um, had, them, uh, had to have only one year less or less to live, and people didn't really want to admit that they only had one year or less to live. So that was difficult. But my question, basically, Stacy, is for you, which is that the, the, the big challenge. How did that happen? <laughs> the, the big <laughs> challenge right now to uh, doing marijuana research is the monopoly that's held by the federal government on the supply of marijuana. And marijuana will never be made into a medicine by private sources as long as NIDA has the monopoly because their marijuana can only be used <coughs> for research, not for prescription use. So I'm, I'm wondering if the, 
if you think there might be some way we could get NIDA-funded researchers to appeal to NIDA to say, let's end the monopoly and let privately funded um, operations grow marijuana, and it's still gonna be regulated by FDA, DEA, institutional review boards. It's not like it opens the door to everybody getting marijuana. I think we're seeing a little bit of a change, and we talked a little bit about this today, in terms of things like Epidiolex, which is manufactured by GW Pharma. Not a US company, but a UK company. And so for the first time, this drug was granted orphan status, and in fact is in clinical trial, phase one, clinical trials in kids with pediatric epilepsy in both New York and, and San Diego. So it's starting. I think, I think there's been some motion, and there's, I believe, a clinical trial funded by NIDA that uses Sativex, also a UK GW Pharma product. Um, so I, I think the tide is, is turning a little bit. Well, that, that's the, uh, marijuana grown in Israel now, right, it, licensed by the government, is grown for 50 cents a gram, $14 an ounce. And so the GW Pharmaceuticals, which has a license to grow marijuana, does not want competition from the plant. And, and as you've said, Dr. Cooper, that, that a lot of people do think that there's a lot of value from the plant itself. So I think, okay. do we really want to turn this over entirely to uh, large for-profit pharmaceutical companies, or do we want to let other people, even for-profit and non-profit organizations, grow to research the plant? And I, I think that's the policy issue that we need to get over, and I think NIDA-funded researchers could help make that happen. That's a great point. Thank you. Point. Thanks. So I actually had a follow-up on that oh, okay. in relation to, ask to Dr. Remember Goblin's to, question. Remember to pose the question. And the what question. it really is, is are there other psychoactive substances that we are ignoring because of politics rather than because of science? For example, the MDMA. Uh, and there are a lot of other natural substances that have known psychoactive activities. Our pharmacopoeia is full of, of natural products that we rely on for all kinds of medical therapeutics, and are there other therapies that we should be considering in addition to marijuana? Yeah, well, look, I, I you know, to, to be fair, my, my documentary was all about medical marijuana, so I, I didn't become an expert on all psychedelics all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the but I think the MDMA example is a good example. I mean, that that the idea that this, you know, people think it's ecstasy, and I think people think of this as purely in the recreational sense. But the idea that there have been trials that have looked at it, and there are ongoing trials now for people who have refractory PTSD. You know, I got interested in this, not, not just because of the, the medical therapeutics of some of these things, but also this idea, what, what really became sort of outrageous for me in this whole thing was that a lot of times these people did not have an existing therapy for whatever their problem, whatever ailed them whether it be epilepsy, whether it be really refractory, debilitating PTSD, the, these are legitimate problems. We're seeing it con with returning veterans now, um, something else that, that Rick is working on. But the idea that you could you have something out there that could potentially offer a benefit when nothing else has, to me, was, was almost a, a moral outrage as opposed to just the medical component of it. So, I'm sure the answer is, is yes to your question. I mean, the idea that medical marijuana may um, force us to evaluate the whole drug development system overall, the idea to look at products that maybe don't get a lot of credence because people may think it's a plant, maybe I can't patent it, maybe I can't make money on it, I don't know. I'm not sure what drives all that sometimes, but the... Uh, I, I have to interrupt you there. There are numerous patented natural products that are in the pharmacopoeia, and to suggest that the pharmacal pharmaceutical companies won't pursue them because they can't make money because they're from a plant. It's just not true. Well, it hasn't happened with medical marijuana. No, I understand, because it's 4,000 years old. You can't patent that plant. But Taxol is a plant that's used in the therapy of breast cancer that comes from a tree. So, I mean, there are many, many. I, I'm not going to list them all, obviously. But the pharmaceutical industry is very interested in natural products, and they're pursuing them aggressively. Yeah, Sounds like a, a some of them. Yeah. A perfect way to follow up, I think, when we're, when, once we've sort of concluded this. This sounds like one of those follow-up things that's going to go on for a long time. <laughs> we can go through all of, all of the list. <laughs> Actually, so I've been asked to go in a clockwise order. Yes, oh. sir. That was a very good talk. So uh, I'm Dr. Singh. I'm one of the surgical residents. And uh, because I went to medical school, all my friends think that I know everything about marijuana. <laughs> and they ask me, like, if you had to rank recreational marijuana compared to alcohol and cigarette smoking, like, one, two, three, how do you rank it? And depending on how much beer I had, like, my answer changes. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know what's your take on it. 
<laughs> I have had no beer, just to be clear. Um, you know, I, these, these sort of moral equivalence questions, I, I sometimes, um, I, I think, I think you, you can provide answers on that depending on what you're specifically looking at. Like, wh how do you answer a question like that in terms of, in terms of what? Uh, how, how are you comparing it? I mean, if you're looking at it purely from a recreational standpoint, is one better than the other in terms of not creating harm? Or, or what, what is it? You know, and I'm not asking you to answer that because I think everyone, everyone answer, asks the question and we're hoping to elicit a different response. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I tried marijuana once. I didn't particularly care for it. It made me really anxious. And I'm kind of like, I, I like to be in control of my environment and I'm an athlete and I just, you know, it wasn't for me. So is that a good thing for me? No. Do I have an occasional beer? Yes. You know, so I, you know, I, I just, I, I think it, it, was a, it was a distraction from what we were really trying to talk about with regard to medical marijuana, which is, you know, some of this other discussion uh, about the fact that this could be a legitimate medicine, which for whatever reason, you know, whatever, whatever the reasons may be, has not been legitimized in a way that I think maybe it should have been for, for quite some time. And I think a lot of people got hurt or, or, or did not get a treatment that may have benefited them. And, that, and that's really where I, I focus my attention. I mean, the, the idea of, uh, it comes up in, in one context, which is that if this is a, does become a legitimate medication more widely used, then, then what about things like driving? You know, do, should, if someone is taking this as their medication, can they still drive? You know, you can't drive when you've been drinking. But, but, you know, so, so I think those are, those are fair questions to ask, but just as a recreational thing, I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you have an opinion on that? I think actually your point about driving is a hugely important one because for the first time, according to the Monitoring the Future study just this last year, uh, high school seniors reported having driven just after smoking marijuana more frequently than having gotten behind the wheel after drinking. It's the first time that's happened. So it's really something to be paying attention to in right. terms of the ultimate impact. Thank you for the question. Dr. Halpern. Yeah, hi, John Halpern, uh, Director of Laboratory for Integrative Psychiatry at McLean Hospital, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Just a very quick comment, but a couple of questions. The quick comment is just about, Stacy, about, about medications that don't have dosimetry built into it. So when we have a patient with cluster headache and we tell them to inhale oxygen, it's to effect. We don't tell them, you have to inhale 1,000 liters. So we have medications that are exactly the same as mm -hmm. what occurs right now with marijuana. Moreover, tincture of opium, which all of the constituents of which have not been identified, mm -hmm. is a prescribable medication in the United States, right. though rare. Methamphetamine, a drug of abuse, well, the blue stuff down into five milligrams is called desoxin, is a brand name medication. So we have the ability to mm -hmm both understand how a drug can be used and abused. So I have a couple questions. The first one is I'd love to hear, Sanjay, your opinion about this bizarre thing that the FDA issued in the final years of the final Bush administration, this strange report saying that marijuana has no medical utility whatsoever, that there's no evidence for this. It's not a medicine. And at the same time, uh, DEA moved Marinol from Schedule II to Schedule III because it has no um, real uh, diversion or abuse potential that warrants it being placed into Schedule II. Implication being that it's a fairly safer medication. That's the, the active ingredient in whole marijuana. But we have our own FDA saying that there's no medicinal properties to this drug. Is it the sesame oil that the marijuana that the THC is suspended in that converts it into being a medicine? Why is you know how do we wrap ourselves around uh, when there's polemics like this? And then the second wait, wait, part of the wait, wait, wait. Stop yeah. with one. Just stop right. with one with the so question that's the first mark. Question. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that, that was that was a frustrating part for us as well when trying to make this documentary because ultimately, you know, we you know, when you're doing a document <coughs> documentary like this, you want to have it be satisfying for people and not just have them left with a bunch more questions about all this. I think it was actually even earlier than the end of the Bush administration when some of what you're talking about really got codified in some ways, right? Where they where they took this and I think it was 72. Where they, where they said this is now a Schedule One substance because of lack of evidence regarding its medical benefit. Uh, but even at the time that that was decided, I think that the, the whole letter which I, which I read said we anticipate that there will be evidence within the next year or so right. to, 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 to look at this situation again. And that was you know, 1972. So it never really uh, got fully evaluated, I think, in, in a meaningful way at the level of Health and Human Services 
since that time, it's, it's a long time ago. When you take out an active ingredient, like they did with Marinol, one active, pluck it out and essentially create a pharmaceutical drug, um, they took out THC and made this drug, did it somehow change it in some way? And, and therefore they skirted around the issues of scheduling it in the same schedule as, as marijuana. And I think it's gonna raise the question again, predicting the future, that as we do these whole plant extracts, like Stacy's talking about, and create medications out of those, is that still schedule one substance? Can you prescribe a schedule one substance for medical benefit? I mean, it's the most hypocritical thing. It has no, but it's scheduled as a substance that has no medicinal benefit, here's a prescription for it. I mean, that's, that's essentially the, the unbelievable situation that we could be in, and it's happening because there are clinical trials going on in this country now with whole plant extracts of marijuana. So it's gotta change in some way. I, and, and I think there's a lot of people who say marijuana should be scheduled down should be a different scheduled substance. Be before your second question, I'm getting a motion, then I, ha I have to continue this way. Hold on. Oh. Did you have a question? I do. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Sure, thank you. My name is Renee Viom. I'm um, a master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, you've talked primarily about the use of medical marijuana for conditions where other treatments haven't really worked, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the use of medical marijuana for chronic pain and whether or not you think that it can be a solution for changing, particularly here in the United States, the relationship people have with painkillers and overdose. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. I think that there's um, some real utility uh, of cannabis for especially neuropathic chronic pain. That's the, the pain that, again, comes from nerve injuries and I know can be really difficult to treat. Sometimes narcotics can work. A lot of times patients are put on essentially uh, medications that are, that are nerve stabilizers, things that try and actually work on the nerve itself, but it's really, really difficult to treat pain. And I, and I should point out, and I think maybe you're alluding to this, this, this idea that in this country, as things stand now, um, someone dies of an accidental prescription drug overdose every 19 minutes. Um, these are accidental prescription drug overdoses, and usually it is narcotics. And we know that uh, narcotic pain pills, um, typically people will, will start to develop a tolerance to these. So after a few months of taking these regularly, it won't work as well. And as a result, they take more. And they start to combine it with other medications, uh, including alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a real prescription for disaster. We know because I've researched this as part of the marijuana documentary that the average time frame from, from the time of the first prescription to the time of death is 36 months. It's just three years. Most often these are people who've never taken pain pills before. They often go into the ER with back pain for the first time and they're given a narcotic prescription. And if they're going to die, and again, every 19 minutes someone does die like this, mm -hmm. it happens within three years. Hmm. We know that marijuana can, can either help uh, reduce the amount of pain medications, narcotics that people are taking, or have them not take any of these narcotics at all. And uh, there have been studies on this, again, many of them um, in other countries. One of the big ones was in Israel, again, that we saw. But it's, it's quite a remarkable situation. We didn't talk about that as much in the documentary because, again, I, I was, was really interested in this, this standing on its own merits. You know, the idea that you, we would compare this to narcotics and say narcotics has a really high risk profile mm -hmm. where people die in this manner uh, and therefore marijuana is, is better because of that. It, I think it's interesting, but the idea to me was more interesting that, that marijuana should just stand on its own merits scientifically in terms of what it does in the body. And, 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 I, and I apologize if that's hard for you to hear. I don't know, is this, is this a personal thing No, for no, you? no, not at all. I was just curious. Okay, all right. Just curious. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Rohan Goel. I'm a student here at the college, and um, I was just curious to hear your thoughts on managing kind of the social impacts that uh, medical marijuana sales and uh, and uh, production have. I know in my like in my home state of Colorado, there's uh, municipalities that sell marijuana, uh, see increases in crime, and they see businesses moving to other municipalities and moving out of state even uh, to avoid the temptation, so to speak. Of employees. Yep. And what did you say uh, the governor said recently? So governor Hickenlooper yesterday came out in the midst of, I guess, uh, a debate and mentioned that he felt that Colorado's passage of recreational marijuana may have been, quote, reckless. 
in terms of, again, simply policy on pacing science and many things we don't know and they have social implications as well. So I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important topic, certainly. Yeah, I mean, there's two states, you know, I mean, you know, and Governor Hickenlooper sort of acknowledged when this, when this happened, when this passed, that this was, this was a, this was an experiment in so many, so many ways for this country. And a lot of people are going to be looking to Colorado to see how it goes uh, there, uh, both in terms of the impact, the social impact, in terms of revenue for the state, which was, a lot was made of that initially when it passed. But, um, you know, I think it, this is, we're looking at something real time now and, and seeing, you know, other states may behave differently, but this is, a, I think, going to be an example, I think, for a lot of other states that are considering recreational marijuana, which is just Colorado and Washington. Currently, right. Great question, though. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Emily Venable. I'm a student here as well. Earlier, you mentioned how the Israeli doctor isolated a nitro, a nat natural form of the cannabinoid in the body. I was wondering, is there a relationship between the diseases and the ailments that medical marijuana is helping and about the body's inability to synthesize this? Or is it just that the medical marijuana is exacerbating the um, natural biological use of this cannabinoid in the body? Um, it, it's a great question. And, and Stacey, I'd be interested to see what you have to say as well. I, I will um, point out that it, it, I was really fascinated by this idea that when you looked at head injuries or, or neuro injuries of some sort, part of the, 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 the way that they started thinking about this was when they looked at these patients with head injuries and started looking at all the various things in the, the cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, that some of these natural or endogenous cannabinoids were increased in amount. So the body was somehow starting to make the cannabinoids seemingly in response to whatever the injury was, either you know, someone had a brain injury, they had a stroke, whatever it might be. And, and then from that, the idea was, well, if the body is doing this, if we supplement and give more, could it have additional benefit? So I, I think that that was sort of the, the genesis of this idea of using some of these cannabinoids as a, as a neuroprotectant or even something that would decrease inflammation in the brain after, after an injury. That's a great question. There have been some studies outside the US, one in particular that comes to mind that sort of resonates with what you're saying. In a cohort of patients with schizophrenia, patients were given either sort of a standard antipsychotic or they were given cannabidiol. And what they found was both things actually reduced psychotic symptoms. But in the patients who had cannabidiol, they had a far lower uh, side effect profile. And in those patients only, there was a very clear relationship between the reduction of symptoms and increased anandamide levels. So it sort of speaks to your, to your question quite, quite nicely, in fact. Um, there's clearly a synergy between them. So great question. Thank you. Thanks. We're working our way back here. Yes, we're getting to you. Yes. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the interesting discussion. My name is Peter Jackson. Um, I'm one of the child psychiatry fellows here and feel like I'm, I think about this for, uh, in the context of what I see as a pretty vulnerable population. Um, being a strong believer in science, it makes me slightly uncomfortable to think about policy and uh, you know, that moving forward, outpacing science. I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on what is the velocity difference between how fast policy is moving and how fast science is moving? And I guess my question is, can science catch up and make sure that we make safe decisions if policy is moving at the velocity that it's at and maybe not slow down. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And you know, the context, as, as Stacy sort of said, is that you know, we, we, there's been a sort of pendulum swing here, right? It, it hasn't been just sort of a natural trajectory. At one point in this country, again, uh, we did have cannabis on the pharmacopoeia, uh, we saw a, the book that we doctors look at to prescribe medications. And we know its history in a lot of other countries around the world. Policy uh, outpacing science, I think, sort of affects things both ways. We're seeing it at the state level, where states are just deciding that, you know what, we're not going to wait for the science because uh, it's, it's taking too long or there's too many barriers in place to, to actually get the science done, so we're just going to do this ourselves. So you could, you could see how the science is, is slowed down at the same time because of policy. So states deciding on their own, but then the policies and, and the laws that we have in this country make it really challenging for the science to get done. It's hard to, 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 to basically go and, and study something 
that has already been preordained as having no medicinal benefit and, and conducting a study that tries to show its medicinal benefit. It's hard in so many ways, be, you know, from the approvals that you need to get, from the ability to actually obtain the substrate, the marijuana for study, there, there's just a lot of challenges. So I would say for, for the time being, I think the science is improving. There are more trials that are getting done probably than ever before. Stacy uh, used the word watershed moment, you know, in our history now in terms of what's happening with scientific research. But it's still being outpaced, I think, by policy. That, 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 that the equation is still not balanced, I think, in, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. That's a great question, though. Thank you. Yes, I'm coming. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Jeff Hoffman. I'm actually not a student here, here with a friend. I'm a family physician. And, um, you know, I've uh, seen the science outpace the policy, and I just wonder if anyone has any if anyone on the policy end or if anyone from the scientific community has addressed anybody to help them generate someone who can help them with the policy, since it seems to be very non-scientific. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> no, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good point, and I think it's something that everybody's sort of struggling with at the same time. So how do we, how do we begin to make strides with regard to having science catch up with policy, sort of dovetailing on, on but, but, the last question? You know, and, and, and let me say, the, 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 there's, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a nuance, I think, to that as well, and that is that, you know, look, there, there's a lot of stigma around this issue at all levels. I mean, I remember after we made the first documentary, I got calls from people um, leaders in medicine, um, judges, including federal judges, uh, politicians, many politicians who, who ha wanted to have these conversations all off the record, do not identify me, and tell me what they believed with regard to the potential of medical marijuana, and in some cases even what medical marijuana had done for themselves or, or, or loved ones. Um, and it was, it, was, it was quite striking, almost jarring a little bit because it was almost like I was running a marijuana confessional all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the, the, the stigma, you know, aside from the policy and the, the, the science, the stigma is a, is a, it's a real issue. And I think, you know, even there's, I think scientists who will, may believe that there's real legitimacy here, but will stay away from this topic because they just don't want to deal with the stigma that's going to come with it. Um, Politicians are unlikely to run on this issue because as much as they may believe in it, uh, they don't know that they're ever gonna win on it. And so as a result, it just sort of stalls. As much momentum as it may have, even as the scientific evidence builds, it, that's gonna be a big cross to bear. I think it's gonna be a challenging one. And, and again, you know, for, for me, it, it, it's one of these things, what, what pushed me more into to, to reporting this was the idea that it seemed um, morally wrong to not have something available that could help when nothing else has. I think you know a lot of these patients try everything already for these various conditions and they don't get any relief. And, and as I said, I, I too easily, I think, dismissed all of them as malingerers who were just simply trying to, to get high. And there is a fair amount of that. I see it too. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and if it, I was, if medical marijuana was legalized in North Carolina, I don't think I would prescribe it because I'm not sure I want I want somebody who may be coming to me just as a malingerer or somebody who just wants to drug. I got that problem already with chronic pain. And I don't know if I want that burden with marijuana. Mm. Certainly a huge I, problem for so many people I, making these decisions. Yeah. We could have a back and forth on that. Yes, we could. And, and actually, I, I'm going to interrupt here for just a second because I see that we're now at 7.08. Do we have time for one last question? Is that OK? I'm getting the yay sign. It's a hard one. I have somebody who didn't have a question yet. But, but you can ask your question right after. We could do. We could maybe do both. Uh, my name is Dr. Yasmin Machine. I'm also an addiction neuroscientist at uh, McLean Hospital. I see we're well represented here tonight. <laughs> Uh, so my question is, uh, it's sort of actually follow up a little bit on the one just now. What sort of prescriptive thresholds do you think should exist for physicians in terms of prescribing medical marijuana, particularly because I think there's been a lot of reports of the ease of acquiring the medical marijuana. 
Yeah, the medical marijuana card. I mean, definitely out of California and Colorado, it seems like you can just go and just get, oh, my arm hurts, and you just get one. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to what the burden of proof maybe should be or what sort of prescriptive threshold should exist. It's, it's a tough question, and you know, it, it doesn't come up with just marijuana. Obviously, it comes up with lots of different medications, no, notably narcotics. You know, we, we, we deal with that a lot, and pain is, you know, it's a difficult thing to measure. You know, you, you'd, you'd wish that you could objectify this in some way. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a real problem. I think that there are a lot of people who, who obviously abuse the system, and that abuse exists with marijuana and it exists with other medications, I, the, 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 I, I almost in some ways ask the reverse question, which I, ma I imagine you may have considered as well, which is that what is the price you're willing to pay to, to deny somebody a therapy that could potentially be beneficial to them? And, and would, you, would you raise the thresholds knowing that you might start to exclude patients who could get benefit, who, who will suffer now because of these increased thresholds? And I don't know there's an easy answer to that. At what stage do you think that medical marijuana then should be, should other medications, therapeutics be tried first and then perhaps bring it to medical marijuana? Or I, I, where do you think in the, I, think I guess so. maybe on an individual basis? You know, well, I yeah. think so. Like, you know, I gave the example of, you know, Charlotte, this little girl. I mean, she, she, had, she had done the latter of the various anti-epileptic drugs. And ultimately, we may get to the point in this country where we realize that this may be a less uh, risky proposition to do this. We're not there yet. So as a, because of that, I think you try the, the, the things that have actually gone through an FDA approval process first, I, I, I would think. I know that, that that's not what always happens, obviously. There's a lot of people who get their cards far too easily, which is the point that you're making. But you know, from, if you're serious about the science and serious about this potentially as a medicine, ultimately I think this gets treated the way that any other medicine gets treated. And um, when we actually have science that, that can be conducted and looked at and agreed upon and published in journals, and it takes away some of the, the stigma surrounding this, I think we can more easily get to the point where we can establish those thresholds. And you know what? It's not going to work for all these things that are currently on the list. And, and that'll be something that needs to be told to people. They can't get it for every single thing that currently is, is on a lot of those, those, those lists. So. It's a great, great question. Thank you. So again, we could go on about this for hours, and unfortunately we can't, we're out of time. But I'd like to thank the JFK Forum for hosting us, and our esteemed guest, Dr. Gusha, for spending time with us tonight thank you. in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.